Hello, PBF youth families. This is Matthew Wick here. I am the middle school director, and we are kicking off middle school youth group September 6th from 6.30 to 8.30. It's going down every Wednesday, just middle schoolers in the main church building, Wednesdays, 6.30 to 8.30. And this year, I want to do some things to support families in discipling their youth. One, I want to record the sermons that your students are hearing on Wednesday nights so that you can watch them or listen to them and you will know what your students learning and you can continue having conversations based off these lessons that will grow your students in their faith. The second thing is I want to put in the parent email some questions that parents can ask their students based off what we're learning on Wednesday nights. So if you're still listening, uh, right on. I'm actually going to give the first sermon right here, and it's going to be less than 10 minutes. So check it out. Your, your youth on September 6th is going to be learning about one of the parables of Jesus. Parables are something Jesus used um, to hook in his listeners. They were often obscure analogies and sounded a lot like riddles that you're like, what does this really mean? And I wonder if you can think of a character from a movie that often talked in obscure analogies and riddles that actually those sayings had great meaning. For me, it's Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid. He would tell Daniel's son all sorts of analogies about bamboo trees, and he told Daniel's son that he needed to learn to wax on and wax off. And then he made Daniel's son go paint his fence and wax his vintage cars. And the whole time, Daniel's son is confused. What do these sayings mean? But like a good student, he strove to understand. He went and waxed Mr. Miyagi's car, painted fences, and eventually he realized the beauty of the sayings Mr. Miyagi as a teacher was saying. He realized all that wax on, wax off stuff is all training him to kick some serious butt in the karate dojo ring. And if we would dig into Jesus's parables, though they're obscure at first, we would learn to kick some butt for the kingdom of heaven if we learned their true meaning. Kind of cheesy analogy about parables, but I'm a youth pastor. That's what I do. Let's get in to one of Jesus's parables the parable of the sower we read about in Matthew chapter 13. And your youth will be reading the Bible in their small group, this very story, but I'm going to paraphrase it for now. The parable of the sower is about a sower who goes out to sow seeds. He sows four batches of seeds in four different locations. The first seed is spread along a path and birds come and eat it. Why does this matter? What does this mean? The second seed is sowed along rocks and the seed grows into crop quickly, but it has no roots and the sun comes and scorches it and it all dies. What does this weird analogy mean? The third seed is sowed among thorns and it tries to grow in the crop at the the thorns choke it out before it can grow. What is going on here? The fourth seed, it's sowed on good soil and it produces a bunch of crop, a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. So let's review these four seeds. One's along the path, the birds eat it. Seed number two, rocks, but has no roots. It grows, but it's scorched by the sun. Seed number three, thorns, it's choked out. But seed number four, it grows amazing crop because it's planted on the good soil. What does this parable mean? It's just as confusing, if not more so, as Mr. Miyagi's sayings. Jesus thankfully explains what it means in Matthew chapter 13. He says that the seed is God's word. God's word that can be planted in the soil of our heart, but we need our hearts to be good soil where God's word can grow. God's word in good soil will grow into good works. That's what the crops are, good works that bless the earth with godly action. 
And here's what the four seed mean, four seeds mean according to Jesus. The meaning of the first seed that falls along the path and the birds eat it. Jesus says that the birds are the devil that come and snatch away the word of God from our heart. The devil snatches away God's word through lies. Remember in Genesis, the serpent shows up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and asks Eve, did God really say that? I mean, did God really say to these youth, hey, you should honor your parents, or is that outdated? Did God really say, don't cheat on that test, or is it just a little bit of cheating is okay? Did God really say, don't lie, or is a little white lie okay? Did God really say, forgive those who hurt you or love your enemies? I mean, did God really say, don't look at that on the computer? Or, or did God really, you know, say that we shouldn't be consumed by things like video games for nine hours a day at all? I mean, the Bible doesn't even talk about video games. So, I mean, did God really say that? The devil obviously is out to lie to us, to steal away God's word by questioning, did God really say that? But Jesus in the wilderness defeated the devil when he was tempted for 40 days by reciting to the devil scripture. So how we can avoid being like the seed that is eaten by the, the, the birds is one, to understand scripture, which means study scripture. Come to our Sunday Bible study classes. We do at 915 every week. Um, study scripture with you know, your family, get on a Bible reading plan and be consistently learning scripture. There's tons of resources out there. I love the Bible Project. They have a podcast, they have videos, articles that help me understand scripture. The second thing is live like scripture is true. Put it into action, put your stake in it and, and make it happen. If you know that God says something in his word, live it out. The third one is seek accountability. Mentors in your life who know what's going on with you and can, you know, like your small group leader and can say, dude, you're totally being lied to by the devil. That's not what God actually says. The second seed, well, this seed had a great start. It was on rocky soil, but it had no roots. It shot up quickly. It's like students who just get baptized or go to camp and they've heard from the Lord. They're, they're committed, but then a few months later, they, they fall away because they had no roots. And when things got hard, when the sun came up and scorched them, they burned right up. How do we avoid having a great start, but then no roots? Well, we attend youth group or Sunday church with our family or both consistently. We're consistently in prayer and reading. Great plan is to, is to have 15 minutes of prayer a day and, and read a chapter of the Bible a day. If you don't know where to start, you can start in Matthew. There's a, I love the Bible app has, has all these different reading plans you can get on. We need to lay down roots so that when the sun or the rain or the hardships of life come, that we are founded and rooted in Jesus. Seed number three, it falls among the thorns and it is choked out. This meaning is that when God's word is planted in our hearts, it can often become choked out by the world. The world is so noisy. The world is anything that distracts us from the Lord. It can be being so fixated on getting a higher rank in Fortnite or collecting diamonds in Minecraft, being glued to a screen for like six hours a day. It can be overly consumed with what our friends think about us or what that special person we have a crush thinks about us. It can be fixated on getting rich. It can be fixated like I was as a youth on skateboarding. My whole fixation on things was so unbalanced from being fixated on God to being fixated on my own interests. And I needed, well, to have both. It's good to be, you know, enjoying things like skateboarding or, or just, a, you know, 30 minutes on Minecraft, sure. Or, or board games with friends or spending time with those we love. But when all of that gets so out of balance and it becomes so much noisier than God's voice in our life. And it becomes the thing that leads us and guides us. Man, we become out of balance. We become choked out in God's word 
It can't grow. So what do we do? Well, we've got to cut out the thorns. We've got to cut out the distractions that choke God's word. We've got to keel back on how much time we spend on screens, or we have got to find a way to stop caring so much about whether we are the richest or the most beautiful or the most well-liked. We need balance. And that really starts with pressing into God, into his word, into conversations about faith with our family, into prayer. We become balanced out on our time with God. We want to avoid becoming the seed that is one, lied to by the devil. The second seed that has no roots and when life gets hard, falls away. And third, we don't want to become the seed that's choked out by the world. We want to become the fourth seed that's planted on good soil. My prayer for youth this year is that they position themselves in a place where their hearts are good soil. And really that takes seeking to understand God. Just like it's work to understand these parables, it is work, it's time, it's energy, it's Bible reading, it's showing up consistently for youth group and church, all to understand God's ways more, which then make us love God, which then make us want to live for God. So if you made it through this whole sermon, thanks for listening. I hope it blesses you. I hope you have some points to talk about with your youth. I hope even parents, you can look in your own life and say, which which batch of seeds am I most like? Seed number one that got taken by the birds. Seed number two that had no roots. Seed number three that got choked out by the world or that good soil of seed number four. Oh, I pray that your youth would produce much crop for the Lord and experience the abundant life in Jesus. And so would you, youth parents. Till next time, adios.